So, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Martin Dorfler. I'm a uh, critical care physician who's now working in industry. Um, and I'm here to welcome you to the NSEPSIS annual forum, uh, where we stop our busy days for a few hours and honor those we've lost, recognize those left behind and the, as well as those who were, have been injured by this illness, and at the same time honor and applaud the many, some in this room, others online and elsewhere, who have dedicated all or significant portions of their professional careers to try and to change the outcomes so that we stop losing loved ones and stop seeing harm um, in lo other loved ones. Um, go to my, I can figure out how I'm moving my slides here. You go to the, to the next slide, please. I just want to put up our sponsors here. Uh, we want to thank our sponsors of the forum here today. You can read them. I've learned not to read slides. I'm not usually all that good at it, but I'm going to do it today. Uh, and uh, with that, I'd like to welcome Kieran Staunton. Kieran and Orla, as I think everybody knows, uh, lost their then 12-year-old, now would-be 24-year-old son a dozen years ago. And in that heartbreak, set off on a journey that brings us here today. Um, and has had major impact, certainly, in New York State, where I started working with them, with some of the folks here in the room, some of them not in the room, and around the country, and now around the world, taking their pain and turning it into energy to bring us all together and align us on a common mission to change the way we care for sepsis patients, the way we recognize this so that, in their, in their words, and Kieran can speak for himself, other families don't have to suffer as they and some of the folks in this room have suffered with the loss of loved ones. So Kieran, if I can invite you up, um, thank you for... Thank you, Dr. Dorfler. Let me start off by getting rid of a couple of myths about sepsis. Sepsis is not hard to find. It's not complex. There's nothing about sepsis that's complex. And there certainly is nothing about a sepsis death that is in any way complex. Sepsis is a preventable death. That's the heading, and that's what we need to know. As we welcome everyone to our seventh annual forum, we are being watched by more than 32 countries around the world as we sit here, and most states here, by most people who say and know that the US and New York in particular leads the way in the battle against the killer in our midst. Our friends in Australia, Sepsis, Trinidad, Botswana, all of them are here. Our daughter Kathleen is watching us in Dublin, as is Ronan Cassidy, who has an event for Sepsis next week in Dublin. But since we met last year, 350,000 Americans died. 1.7 million Americans were in hospital. And of those 350,000 deaths, oh, sorry, 350,000, people had to do like Orla and I had to do. And people shouldn't forget this. People had to go down to the funeral home and buy a coffin where there was no need to go and buy a coffin. The New York stats will show, and we'll show, 
that this 22-page booklet has saved 20,000 lives in New York between 2014 and 2020. Now, that's according to the New York Department of Health and other independent groups. We're not saying come in here every year because we want to. We are coming here every year because Orla and I and Kathleen don't want people to go through what we've gone through. The picture was that on a Tuesday night, and I want everyone to remember this, a five, year, five foot nine, 165 pound Rory Staunton walked into a pizza store with me and they asked him what type of pizza he wanted. And the following Tuesday, I walked into a funeral home and they asked me what kind of a coffin I wanted. That's the realism of the situation. It's not a statistic. It's a coffin. It's a preventable death. And we have many leaders, political and various governmental agencies. We've come a long way in the last number of years. We've come a long way and we'll have some reports on that later on. But the first person we're introducing here today may be here in live himself yet, don't be surprised, but he has seen the video. He is the Senate Majority Leader, Charles Schumer. Both he and his magnificent staff are probably the leaders, in, not in just in the United States, but in the world, in the battle against sepsis. But his friendship, the morning after Rory died at 7.30, I got a phone call on my cell phone. This is Charles Schumer here. First thing, I want you to keep this number and I want you to call it at any time. We've called it quite a bit. He may regret that, but we have called it. He's been a friend of all of ours. Orla, Kathleen, myself. He knew Rory. He met him many times. He has done more to defeat that killer sepsis than most others put together, all others put together. He, um, when I describe him as a friend, I think it's actually a small word. He's more than that. And this past year, he made history when he got sepsis into the United States budget. Got what they should do, got it through committees, got many millions of dollars for CDC. That was whittled down to two million, but that'll increase it again. The first time in history. Consider this, since Rory died, three and a half million Americans have died of sepsis. And this is the first year they were allowed to put something into the budget. He also has persuaded other agencies to get serious about sepsis. Because whenever they come into his office, on various issues. He put sepsis at the top of it. There is not enough time or enough words that I could say here today for Senator Charles J. Schumer to let people know what he has done. But with that, you can hear it from himself. Senator Hi, everyone. It's Senator Chuck Schumer. And I'm really honored to welcome you to the seventh annual National Forum on Sepsis. I wish I could be there in person, but I'm sure with you in spirit. First, I want to recognize an extraordinary family, my friends, Kieran and Orla Staunton, who I've known for many, many years. As you know, their beautiful son, Rory, tragically passed away from sepsis in 2012. We miss him every day. He was such a fine boy. By sharing Rory's story with the world, as hard as it is, Kieran and Orla have increased awareness about sepsis, and by doing so, saved many, many lives. I also want to recognize Northwell's Health CEO and my good friend Mike Dowling, President and CEO of the Feinstein Institute for Medical Research, Kevin Tracy. Northwell has been a leader in the fight against sepsis in New York and across the country. We're so grateful for their work. Every year, roughly 1.7 million Americans are infected with sepsis, and around 350,000 are unfortunately and sadly lost. That makes sepsis the leading cause of death in hospitals, and the most expensive condition treated, costing $38 billion annually. And that's why I fought for and secured critical sepsis funding in last year's government funding bill, marking the first time that sepsis had ever, ever been included in the federal budget. The fund date, funding, research, and mandates I included in the bill will help the federal government expand New York's Rory's regulations model 
to better treat and prevent sepsis infections nationwide. I was also proud to introduce a resolution last year declaring today, September 13th, National Sepsis Day. And at every opportunity, I'm working in tandem with the Biden administration and the CDC to implement their new initiative to combat this terrible disease. So we'll be pushing, keep working together in honor of Rory and countless others. And we won't stop until we end sepsis. Thanks again, and I hope you have a great and productive forum. He may be here later, don't be surprised if he does. Our next speaker is Michael Dowling from Northwell Health. He set the gold standard, and wherever you're watching this around the United States, around the world, people should write down the name Northwell Health. Because Northwell Health has set the gold standard long before many even heard of it. Between 2008 and 2018, Northwell reduced sepsis fatalities by 70%, 70% from starting in 2008. But Michael Downing's position on percentages and percentage of fatalities, he has one position only. The only percentage I want is zero. Zero fatalities. He has been a great friend of ours when we set up Rory's, Rory's Foundation and in sepsis, he was one of the first people to come on board and said, what can I do for you? It's not what was in it for him, it's what can I do for him? We call him on a regular basis. Again, we have a cell phone, he probably regrets that too. But we call him on a regular basis. He's a true friend and I want people to listen to what Michael Dowling has to say. Good morning, everybody. My name is Mike Dowling. I am the president and the CEO of Northwell Health. And I welcome you all to this uh, unbelievably important topic. It is World Sepsis Day, a day when we spend our time thinking about, warning about, creating awareness about the silent killer, sepsis. As you all know, and all of you do know this because you're all involved in one way or another, that it affects about uh, 1.7 million Americans each year and is, causes about 350,000 deaths a year. Pretty extraordinary numbers. So what you do today is important because while progress has been made, and I mentioned that in a few moments, progress has been made, but so much more needs to be done uh, to end sepsis, uh, which of course is uh, part of the central agenda for today's meeting. I'm delighted that uh, three of our experts are speaking to you also today. Dr. Kevin Tracy, head of the Feinstein Institute for Medical Research. Dr. Pete Silver, who is our chief quality officer for the health system and Marty Dorfler, who has been with us uh, for many, many, many years, but has now moved on to uh, other endeavors, but is, uh, is still a friend and still participates with us on this issue. And I'd also like just to take a moment to congratulate uh, Ola and Kieran Staunton. I have known Ola and Kieran for quite a while. I got to know them after the devastating loss of their son, Rory. Uh, since that time, they have dedicated their lives to ending sepsis. They have been compassionate uh, advocates, uh, dedicated to making sure that change happens. And they're not only compassionate advocates, they are advocates that actually get things done. And I'm sure during the course of this morning, you will hear about some of the progress that is a direct result of their efforts. But let me give you just a little bit of history about Northwell's involvement in the sepsis issue. Uh, way back um, two decades ago, uh, we decided to get very, very serious about focusing on the issue of sepsis, uh, trying to create awareness about it. And we in initiated major uh, programs inside Northwell. But in 2010, we did something that I recall vividly. We organized um, international meeting on sepsis, 
Kevin Tracy, who is going to be speaking with you today, was one of the leaders in that effort. We brought together people from all over the world, multiple countries. If I remember, about 13 different countries were represented, where we had a discussion about how do you define sepsis? How should we attack it? In fact, one of the things that emanated from that meeting was the creation of the Global Sepsis Alliance that has done extraordinary work across the world since then. Hundreds and hundreds of organizations involved. In fact, um, World uh, Sepsis Day, uh, the 13th, which is today, uh, is a direct outgrowth of that effort that we held way, way back in 2010. And then in 2012, I had the privilege, unfortunately it was in a bad circumstance, of getting to meet Ola and Kieran Staunton. And we worked with them very diligently, and we created regulations called the Rory Regulations after their son Rory. Those regulations became the standard of care in New York. All New York hospitals have, as a result of those regulations, put in place a set of consistent standards and protocols on how to deal with sepsis emanating from the work of Ola and Kieran Staunton. So as I mentioned at the very beginning, while lots of progress has been made, and there is a lot more awareness today, a uh, lot more knowledge about how to intervene. <coughs> And because of all of those endeavors over the years, thousands and thousands of lives have been saved. Uh, wonderful progress. But as I know you will talk about, more needs to be done. Much, much more. We need to continue the education, continue the awareness, continue to get more government to take more of a proactive stance on this, just as the CDC did recently, again, as a result of Kieran and Ola. So to all of you, for your participation today. Uh, for all, to all of the speakers, I want to say congratulations. I, I want to say thank you. Lives are being saved, but as a result of your endeavors today, more lives will be saved. So my best to all, and again to Kieran and Ola, thank you. It's been a privilege and a pleasure you have made a real substantive difference in the lives of hundreds of thousands of people. Congratulations to all. Have a wonderful, wonderful meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Michael Dowling from Northwell Health, an absolute gentleman. Our next speaker is here in person. She's a true friend of our families. She has written about Rory a number of times. Our foundation is one of our two favourite foundations. She's a true friend of our daughter, Kathleen. My brother-in-law once said she's a victim of a mixed marriage, Kerry and Mayo, but I think that's acceptable anyway. <laughs> um, there's not enough again to say about her, but her name is Maureen Dowd from the New York Times. Maureen, it's great to have you, and thanks for everything you've done. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. It's Claire and Mayo, Kieran, but it's still a mixed marriage. <laughs> uh, Sally Quinn, I'm introducing here. She's a journalist, novelist, and agent provocateur. She's been a force in this town for many decades, just as long as Bob Woodward and Joe Biden. And she's still a glamour puss. So when I read a blog last New Year's by her son, Quinn Bradley, about how he ended up in the hospital two days before Christmas, extremely sick with a kidney infection and sepsis, I knew I had to connect her with my pal, Kieran. Sally was heroic about her son's health struggles, some of which started at birth, 
justice Orloff and Kieran were heroic in turning their son's health struggles into a remarkable legacy for Rory, one that has already saved at least 20,000 lives. Quinn was saved at Christmas in part because he got the results of his sepsis lab test in time, which Rory did not. In his blog, Quinn Bradley reiterated what we all know but have to keep relearning in life, quote, when you have your health, you feel like a king, <clears throat> and when you don't have it, you don't even know if you're going to live. My own grandfather died of sepsis at a hospital near here at 46. He went in for a minor procedure and the next morning he was dead. My mom was 12 at the time and never got over it. In fact, I think that's why she married a man 20 years older. Uh, we are so lucky to have Kieran and Orloff doing prodigious work to curb sepsis and Chuck Schumer. And uh, I would, if Kathleen is watching, I would like to say hi to the lovely Kathleen. And I would like to add a postscript about Sally for the Irish and the audience here and abroad. She's working on a novel in which the model for the romantic leading man is Dermot Martin, the former Archbishop of Dublin, holy thornbirds. So I recommend that to everyone when it comes out. And now here's the amazing Sally Quinn. Thank you, Maureen. Um, I would just like to say that Maureen has been a really cl close friend of mine and my husband, Ben Bradley, who I think secretly had a crush on her, and my son, Quinn, through all of his travails. Um, and I think Maureen probably is one of the most brilliant columnists on the planet. Um, she's an extraordinary writer, and um, it's a must read. At every Sunday, I start getting emails saying, have you read Maureen? <laughs> and you don't even have to ask the last name. Uh, Maureen has also been um, my mentor in all things Irish. I am Irish, but we didn't come over late. We came over early. And uh, so I've lost some of my roots. But Maureen is always sort of, sort of nagging me about being Irish. And yesterday, she sent me an email saying, and it said, list of the coolest na Irish names this year, and one of them was Quinn. I think it was the top one, right? Number one coolest name is Quinn. So thank you, Maureen, for keeping me in my Irish mode. Um, I, you know, I, um, I want to thank Kieran and Orla for all that they have done on the work that they've done. I, the loss of a child is the single worst thing that can ever befall anyone. And um, I never lost my son, Quinn, but he was near death many times uh, in his 41 years. So I can only imagine the horror of it. Quinn spent much of his 41, actually the first 16 years of his life at Children's Hospital and um, he started out having open heart surgery and then many other surgeries and illnesses. Uh, when he was 14, he was diagnosed with um, uh, velocardiofacial syndrome and there are 150 varieties or, or um, manifestations of that syndrome, including heart surgery and learning disabilities and other physical ailments. Um, one of the things that I learned at Children's Hospital, having a chronically sick child, and I was there, I spent a lot of time living there with him in the hospital, is that there were two kinds of parents. One of them, one set of parents would, and this is actually the most frequent, would end up either getting separated or divorced if they had a child who was 
chronically ill or who died. And the other kind of parents were those who took that, what that horrible uh, situation was and turned it into something um, where they could actually help other people. And um, Kieran and Orloff uh, are the latter, obviously, and they've made enormous difference preventing deaths from sepsis. Um, I, in my small part, was being on the board of Children's Hospital. I'm still on Emeritus Board for almost 41 years and also the National Center for Learning Disabilities for almost 30 years. But I haven't done nearly as much as they have, but I've done at least my small part and partly because I, there's never a day that goes by that I don't think about Quinn and what he's been through and what others are going through. He has a blog uh, for people with learning disabilities, which Maureen just quoted from. Um, so my sepsis story, um, so I've never had sepsis and neither has Quinn, but um, three years ago at Christmas, um, Quinn's wife Fabiola, um, they were supposed to leave on Christmas day, Christmas night to go to Israel. Um, for they would spend 10 days. And she started getting sick several days before Christmas, not feeling well. And um, she, by Christmas Day, she could hardly stand up. And we opened presents, and she just collapsed and went up to bed. Their flight left at 7 or something. And so she said, you know, I'm feeling terrible, but I'll just get on a plane and I'll sleep it off. And so I was about to go to Bob Woodward and Elsa Walsh's for Christmas dinner while they... So I got to Bob and Elsa's, and, but I said to Quinn, you've got to take her to the emergency room. She's not getting on a plane this sick. So he took her to the emergency room, and she had sepsis. And um, it was a urinary tract infection. And they said if she, if, if she had gotten on the plane, she would have died on the plane, that there was no way um, that she could have made it. Um, well, anyway, she went to Sibley Hospital, and I have to say that they diagnosed her immediately. Um, and we were so lucky because they just, uh, they, they recognized the symptoms. And um, so she was, but she was sick for weeks after that. Um, Quinn had the same situation this past Christmas where he started getting sick about two, two or three days before Christmas, and then he started having all these pains, and he was throwing up, and, he, and stomach aches, and finally, and he kept putting off and putting off and thinking that it was nothing he'd get over it, and then um, he ended up finally at 6.30 in the morning being taken to Children's Hospital, where he was diagnosed immediately with sepsis, pneumonia, UTI, um, it was, you know, it was a perfect storm. Um, Christmas Day, he spent the whole day in the hospital, obviously. And, and they said that if he had not gotten there, he would have been dead in 12 hours. You know, Quinn gets, he, he gets sick. When he gets sick, he gets really sick because he's had, he still wears a pacemaker, still has a compromised immune system, he still has partially collapsed lung. So, lung. so when he gets sick, he gets really sick. And so I was having Christmas dinner with the, the long-suffering Bob and Elsa um, at my house. And Quinn said, I said, I'll stay here in the hospital if you want. And he said, no, no, no. They had brought, brought him some horrible roast beef Christmas dinner. <laughs> he said, I'll just stay here and watch movies. I feel better. And right in the middle of dinner, he called and said, Mom, you've got to get over here. I'm really sick. And so we just got up from the table and rushed over there. And he was really sick. Um, and he was on antibiotics and everything, but he, again, he was very close to death. So, um, and he was sick for weeks after that and very slow recovering. Um, but both Quinn and Fabiola's stories have happy endings, um, but many don't. Um, we were lucky to have been at a first-rate hospital, Sibley, um, but many are not. And we were lucky to have a supportive family and friends, which many don't. And what Kieran and Orla have done and are doing to end sepsis is crucial. And this is an illness that doesn't have to be 
a death sentence as it was for Rory. Um, and if it's diagnosed in time, um, it can be cured. So I think it's important for all of us to be aware of, of this, the sepsis and the issues around sepsis and to make sure that there is quality care in every hospital and clinic in the country and around the world and that nobody ever has to die of sepsis again. Thank you. Show my age by putting on my glasses. Um, our next speaker, Dr. Kevin Tracy, and as I introduce Dr. Tracy and ask him to come up, I'm going to ask our first panel to also come up, um, and I'll introduce them after uh, <coughs> Dr. Tracy speaks. Uh, so Kevin Tracy, well, the other thing I want to point out here, um, echoing back to uh, Kieran's conversation about having Michael Dowling and Chuck Schumer's cell phone number. Uh, if you give the Stauntons your cell phone number, and I'm sure many people in this room have figured this out already, they will call you. <laughs> um, and I think that's a good thing. And I point that out um, as I introduce my friend Kevin Tracy. Um, and if you send him an email, he won't answer. <laughs> So Kevin Tracy and I go way back. Uh, we began working uh, early in our careers. I was at the NIH. I think uh, Kevin was at the Rockefeller, if I'm remembering correctly. Uh, I don't remember that for certain. Uh, but Kevin um, has been involved in the field of sepsis for a very long time. He's pivoted into working on the, ner uh, the nervous system impact on the immune system, which obviously has significant role here as well in that an intact immune system um, makes it much easier for the body to resist the infectious process that's coming about that then that becomes um, life-threatening for many. Uh, Kevin is the president of the Feinstein Institute at Northwell, uh, the research arm of the uh, Northwell uh, Enterprise, uh, and there leads a large team of investigators working on a number of major endeavors and beyond that, I'm going to let Kevin speak for himself. Uh, Dr. Tracy, if you would come up and uh, uh, give us your, your thoughts. Thank you, Marty. It may go without saying, I answer everyone else's email. <laughs> <laughs> and and um, like everyone else here, I'm here because of the Stauntons, uh, because of their loss and because of their dedication, persistence, and commitment to making the world a better place. Um, but I'm also here for, from a patient, because of a patient I met in 1985 when I was just starting my training in neurosurgery. Her name was Janice. She was 11 months old and she had crawled across the kitchen floor as her grandmother was cooking dinner. The woman turned with a pot of boiling water and tripped and spilled the entire pot of boiling water on Janice. Yes. It was horrible. Um, she was so innocent. Um, but she was a fighter. And uh, although her odds of survival were almost zero back in 1985 for the degree of injury she had, she did terrific. And for a month, she defied the odds. And I was standing one day at lunchtime in the hallway outside her room watching her drink from a baby bottle rocking in a nurse's arms. And she roll, her eyes rolled up in the back of her head, and she died. I ran straight into the room. I put her in the crook of my left arm. I gave her CPR, mouth to mouth, uh, and uh, called the code, uh, which went for an hour, uh, flawlessly, perfectly, no mistakes, uh, but she was gone. When I told her mother what had happened, um, the woman screamed and dropped into a dead faint on the floor. Everything about it was, was horrible. And if you could make it worse in 1985, we had no clue what happened. Um, the dogma was that infection caused sepsis and shock, and therefore she must have been infected. But we knew that she, there was no signs of infection. We had been looking. She was in a burn unit. We had been looking every single day. So something had killed her. And um, the following July 1st, 1985, I went into the laboratory at Rockefeller and at Cornell and started working on that problem, and um, I never came out. I'm still in the lab working on this problem. And what happened, I'd just like to summarize very quickly. Michael Dowling gave a brilliant 
uh, historical account. Um, I want a copy of that tape, please. Um, but um, I, I'd like to create a little perspective for us to think about today, rooted in the past, um, dealing with the present, and focused on the future. Um, what happened in, in the 1980s, very, very quickly, soon after Janice died, my colleagues and I and dozens of other people and, and subsequently thousands um, discovered and, and worked on a new theory of, of inflammation called the cytokine theory of disease. And what happened was we and others identified specific molecules that could cause sepsis and could cause septic shock. And in animals, we invented therapies for that, which in fact cured animals. Um, those therapies now have household names like Humira, Embryl, Remicade, and account for one-third of the trillion-dollar global pharmaceutical industry. So directly out of this sepsis problem has come an entire new way of life for drugs that treat rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, Crohn's disease, and the list goes on and on and on and on. They don't work in sepsis. It was tried and failed. Many of us spent 15. So that takes us from 1985 all the way up until Rory's untimely death. We had, we had invented a new industry. There was drugs that helped millions and millions of people every year, every year since, but nothing for sepsis. What happened after Rory's death was a shift from a government-funded and pharmaceutical industry-funded era of trying to find a magic bullet and cures to patient activisms demanding a change. And that changed everything. That changed absolutely everything. What, I mean, you're hearing about thousands of lives saved in New York State. Imagine multiplying that times all 50 states, which we have to do, and then imagine multiplying that to every country in the world, which we have to do. The multiplier effect on lives saved will be uncountable. And what's amazing to me about that, having lived through this since 1985, <laughs> the things we have to do are give oxygen, intravenous fluid, and antibiotics within six hours after a critical point, someone says, I'm worried about sepsis. So somebody has to think of sepsis, and then these three simple things have to be done. And these, this contributes to saving lives. So that's where we are. And we can celebrate a victory of sorts, and thousands of people probably would agree with that who are still alive and their families. But we're not done. And, and I'd like to like issue a call to action for what the problem today is. So yes, there's one problem is 350,000 people a year are dying. We've got to deal with that. And we still have to keep looking for magic bullets and better mechani scientific mechanistic understanding, because we don't understand it. But there's another problem that looms even larger, if, if you can imagine this. You heard the numbers. 1.3 million people survive sepsis every year. Does anybody know what their mortality rate is? It's 50% five-year mortality rate. It's worse than most cancers. 50% five-year mortality for 1.35 million people a year just in the United States. That, that's a disaster. The Feinstein Institute, my colleagues and I, in collaboration with Cold Spring Harbor in April of this year, hosted a meeting. We convened a meeting at the Banbury Conference Center. We brought in the smartest people in the world in intensive care, in infectious disease, in immunology, in neuroscience, in public health, in, and in critical care medicine. And we asked the question, 35 people for four days, what's going on? No one knows. We don't know the first thing about the fundamental basic mechanisms of why people who survive sepsis go home with severe neuropsychiatric disorders, cognitive impairments, disabilities, and a mortality rate of 50% in five years. But what, it, what we came away with, and, and don't laugh, but you have to start somewhere, it seems that if people are in the ICU for more than five days, that's the problem. So we have two, the call to action is actually very similar to what NSEPSIS Foundation has already successfully accomplished. We need the CDC to look at this post-sepsis syndrome and start to measure it, it to define it and to characterize what is the magnitude of the problem and what can we do about it. And we need government, additional government investment and research support to study the basic scientific mechanisms of post-sepsis syndrome. So I want to thank uh, the Stauntons and NSEPSIS for the invitation to be here. I want to thank you all for your dedication and commitment. And I want to offer a sincere prayer that we follow up on this because a lot of people are counting on us. Thank you.